Well, thank you very much. It's very nice to be at a conference in person again. Um, today I'm going to talk about counting rational points. So let's start with an introduction of the type of problems I'm interested in. I'm going to write here. So we want to count, say, subsets of rational points. For example, well, rational points of bounded height. And as I was about to, to say, for example, uh, problems like in Florian Stokes on Tuesday. And when you give me such a counting problem, then what I usually do, I try to cook up a torso and transform the problem into a lattice point counting problem. So, the idea is just to get a nice situation. And the nice situation means we want to count or to estimate some function n of b, b is going to be the bound, where the problem is counting some integers, say s tuples of integers, satisfying some conditions, where I'm going to call condition of type A conditions on the type of points. by which I mean all conditions except for the height. And then I'm going to call condition H the height condition. And because I use torsors to parameterize my points, then usually for me the height condition looks like some absolute values of some monomials bounded by the bound B. All right, this is the general setting. I don't want to go into the geometry, how to get it here, but I want to talk about how, oh, uh, how to try to approach these kind of problems. So the thing that I want to do today is separate the conditions A and the condition H and treat them separately. So this is what stays at the core of the application of the hyperbola method to count rational points. Well, let's, let's try to use the blackboard nicely. All right, continue here. So the first part of the talk will be about the hyperbola method. And the second half will be an application to count component points. So the hyperbola method for me is a tool that transforms my counting problem estimating the function nb into two sub-problems. And the two sub-problems are, one, counting with respect to a basic height, a very easy height, uh, counting lattice point in boxes. And the second thing is, well, solve a linear programming problem. which means maximizing a linear function over some polytopes. So what I mean with what I wrote down is that once we have the hyperbola method as a tool, as a theorem, as a result we can use, then what is left in order to solve the uh, finding an estimate for n of p is solving these two problems. All right, 
So why do we want to do this? So if the monomials that define the height all involve, each involve only one variable, then the height is easy. We are already essentially counting in boxes and we can solve the problem hopefully, or at least we just have to do part one. But otherwise we have products of variables and then condition of most p, meaning that the region where we want to count our lattice point has spikes, hyperb hyperbolic spikes. It looks like the error under an hyperbola as we know. And so the idea behind the hyperbola method is to have some reasonable flexible counting in boxes and then cover the hyperbolic region of for the main counting problem by boxes and then sum the results over all the boxes and get um, the result. All right, so I'm going to start with discussing the sub problem one. So we get a new counting problem which we want to solve, which is the following. So we fix now bounds B1 to Bs, one for each of the variables. So these are the positive real numbers. And then we want to estimate the new counting function. I'm going to call n prime of B. B is a tuple now and we are just counting now our lattice points with the same condition A and with the condition for the height, which is now very explicit. It's a new condition and it just says the variable Xi has size at most B, I for every I. All right, so in order to apply the hyperbola method result that I'm going to uh, talk about today, uh, we have to know something about this function. So we have to be able to estimate it and we want that the estimate looks like this. So we are going to assume that n prime of b is, can be estimated as a constant times product over all the variables of the b i to some power, say pi i plus some error term of, well, we want to save a power. So we take the same product. And then we save a power of the smallest of the bounds. And the conditions here are that all the powers pi i's are positive and also the saving is actually saving, so we want delta positive. So the fact that I'm asking for this version of the hyperbola method that all these powers here are positive, for example, prevent me to use this method to solve Florian's problem for counting, counting integral points. That would not in general happen if I'm in imposing some integrality conditions. But we have this assumption and then some more assumption that I'm not going to uh, write down explicitly, but essentially we want uniform estimates for the same counting function but the same counting function when we fix some of the variables Xi. And we just want that essentially the counting fixing some of the variables looks like the same, where some constant will depend on the variables we fix, um, and these constants are uniform. All right. So this is about uh, um, the first part. And I'm going to call these conditions star for application later on in our theorem. And now I want to say something about the height. 
So for part two, we want to end up solving a linear programming problem. How do we get there? So we have our height. This is the height h from the original problem. And we are talking about monomials. I'm going to give them uh, a specific shape. So we just write them down. Monomials are just products of powers of variables. So xi in absolute value to some alpha i sigma um, at most p. This is the condition. And sigma is just going to tell me which monomial I'm looking at. So say that we have n of them. And now, the idea is to see that if we count them boxes and say that our new bound bi is a power of b, b to the ti, let's say, then what does it mean for my box with bound bi to be contained in the region, uh, hyperbolic region defined by my uh, height h? If the box is outside, so I don't need to use this box. So I'm talking about admissibility of boxes, meaning the box is contained in the region where I, I'm actually counting points in the original problem. And this is true if, well, if the bound satisfies the height condition, essentially. So this is just some ideas of how to think about this. It's not a proof. So we look at product of, products of bi to the alpha i sigma at most p. And product of bi to the alpha i sigma means, well, because we just wrote bi this way, it's b to the sum of this alpha i sigma times pi. So this condition now is satisfied as soon as this exponent here is at most one. And this condition is going to give me what I'm going to call the height polytope. We usually just call it the polytope. And this is simply the polytope defined by these conditions. So alpha i sigma times t i, we sum them, we want this at most one for every sigma. And for having things meaningful, we always want this to be at least one. So we take the t i's to be at least zero. All right, so I have no negative um, variables satisfying some uh, half plane well, yeah, hyperplane conditions. So I'm going to make a picture here. Let's see. I guess I can do it here. Yeah, so we're all on the same page. The easy picture is the polytope for the projective plane. Then we have three variables, x0, x1, x2. I guess I'm just right here, like this. And then we are going to look at these conditions where uh, each of the variables is at most one. And so, well, what we get is essentially this picture. Where the way to think of this is really we have these three vectors generating my polytope. This is uh, a quadrant. And then we are cutting with three uh, hyperplane which defines the height. And the higher dimensional pictures are just generalization of this. All right, so we have our height polytope. Um, let's continue with the idea, how do we use this? So we have these admissible uh, boxes, good. Then, 
what is the contribution contribution of such an admissible box? So my box contributes well we have an estimate here it essentially contributes this quantity this is product of vi to the pi i's and then vi is the power of v so this becomes just v to the sum of the pi i ti And so the maximal contribution comes from boxes such that this exponent here, sum of um, pi i ti's, has the largest value. And so what we are really, what we really end up doing is try to understand what is the maximal value of this linear function for admissible boxes. And admissible boxes mean the eyes satisfy the condition of being inside the polytope. This is our linear programming program problem. So let's say from this idea, the main term comes from this maximal value of this linear function sum of pi i t i's on our polytope P. And finding such a maximal value is the linear programming problem. Which is really just this. I'm writing it again because I'm going to use it later. All right, so I'm going to call this linear programming problem LP for later reference. And what I get out of this is a series of data. We already have the polytope, we already have the linear function, we are going to get the maximal value. This I'm going to call A. We are also going to get a phase of the polytope where the maximal value is attained. And this comes from the linear programming um, theory. So the phase is going to be called F. And I'm going to record also the dimension of this phase. So this is the data I get when I solve my linear programming problem and the data I need to uh, finally estimate my counting function. And I'm going to put a number of assumptions on my polytope, meaning on the height, uh, which uh, I'm able to deal with in order to uh, use the hyperbola method, which I'm going to put on the board right after. So. We assume that our polytope P is non-degenerate. It is bounded. The boundedness essentially is equivalent to having, for the height to have the Northcott property. Plus some technical condition, which I'm not going to spell out now, but uh, I will uh, explain later. And finally, I'm also going to assume that the phase F is not contained in a coordinate hyperplane of the space where the polytope is, uh, lives. These are my assumptions, double star. 
and the phase not being contained in coordinate hyperplane, what does it mean? It just means, for example, that here I cannot take as phase, well, anything which is contained in, well, for example, any of the axes. And in the case of the projective space with the standard height, the maximal phase is always the vertex opposite to the origin, so the maximal phase would be here where the maximal value is attained. And this satisfies all the, the, the assumptions. That's uh, some sort of fake example. You don't need a hyperbola method to work on the projective space, obviously. But that's a nice picture I can write down. Okay. So here comes the hyperbola method result that we have. So uh, I don't remember if I said it at the beginning, but uh, all this work is joint work with Damaris Schindler. This is in a paper from last year. And our result is that if we assume the assumptions star on the counting over boxes and double star on the height and the associated polytope, then we can solve the counting problem and of B, the original counting problem in the first uh, uh, blackboard. And the asymptotic formula is going to look like this. So we have some constant, which is a product of first S minus one minus D factorial. Remember that D is the dimension of the phase F where the maximal value of the linear function that we optimize on the polytope is attained. Then we have the constant C coming from part one, counting over boxes. And then we get some other constant CP, which is a volume of polytopes, essentially, which I'm going to explain in a moment. And then we get B to the power A, the maximal value, also the solution of the linear programming problem, and then the power of log B, which is D, again, the dimension of the phase where the maximal value A is attained. And then we can save, essentially, a power of log B. So um, I guess I'm going to write here. We get a big O of B to the A, log B to the D minus one. And then for some reason, when we count over boxes, we gain a log log B to the power of S, not a big deal. And so for this constant here, C of P, we compute it as follows. It is a volume, S minus one dimensional volume of, we take our polytope P, we take the hyperplane defined by the linear function has the maximal value here from one to S phi i t i, the linear function we want to maximize on p. If this has the maximal value, then we cut out the phase f. We are not going to do this precisely. We're going to just go down inside the polytope a little bit with this hyperplane. So a minus delta for some delta. And then we are going to compute this volume. And this volume will depend on the choice of delta. And one can prove that this is always well defined and we get some constant CP times delta to the S minus one minus D and then some big O of delta to the S minus D. Here delta is some quantity very close to zero. So this is uh, where CP comes from. we have this estimate when delta goes to zero. Okay. 
No. It is smaller because Delta is smaller than one. It's uh, a little bit of getting used to thinking about estimates when that goes to zero. I get confused all the time, too. But the point is that we just want to understand how this volume depends on the phase, but we are really counting this as minus one dimensional volume. So what really happens is that when we sum all the boxes, at some point we're going to do that, uh, and this we translate this problem as counting lattice points lattice points into some polytope that looks like this. And that's why we use this estimate and why the thing comes into play. But we take this and we multiply by some constant, some, say something like log B. Um, so yeah, it's not just that. It's nice using black board, but it's also some exercise. These are quite heavy. So next I want to uh, explain uh, very briefly the idea behind the proof of this theorem and then show the application. All right, so idea of proof. What do we do? So we are going to distinguish cases depending on whether our lattice point size have big or small values. So in order to do this, I'm going to introduce the notation. We take J subset of my, our, my indices, so my uh, coordinates Xi, that will correspond to large or small values, and then some bounds, so W, one for each of the variables. These are some real numbers. And you have to think that in the proof, at some point, we chose these values to be some sort of some powers of log p. Just to get an idea of how big these are. And then for this data, I'm going to try to write down here the partial counting function and jw, which will be just counting points. This is horrible. We count lattice points. Um, with co uh, with the conditions A and H, the height we started with. And just by saying that the xi's have big values, 
uh, for indices in J and small values for indices not in J. All right. And now if we can understand all of these counting functions, then we can understand the original counting function. So we treat three cases separately. The first case is the case when J is the set of all indices. So all variables are big enough and this is the case where that we, which gives us the main term. All the others contribute to the error term. And to do this, this is really the place where we do these boxes uh, counting. So we have our hyperbola shaped things. We have values of the variables which are big enough. So we are essentially cutting some region, like the region here inside. And then we cover this with boxes inside and boxes that overlap a little bit. So we have two counting functions, one above and one below the actual uh, partial counting function I'm considering. And what we prove is that uh, these two counting functions, one above and one below, they both have the same asymptotic and that's going to give me the main term. Then we also have the case when J is empty. And in that case, all the variables have small values, and I say that these Wi's are essentially powers of log P, so we get something which is bounded by some power of log P, so this is a trivial bound. And then we get the mixed case. J is not empty, but not the whole thing either. And this is the case where now we know we want to get into the error term, so we are not trying to get asymptotic, so just uh, bound. So what we do, first we fix the variables that are not in J. So we fix the small variables and we count the rest. I'm going to call the small variable xj. And to count the rest, we just apply the strategy and the bound for the, from the main term, but only to the restricted set of variables in J. So, and this is somehow where the complications come in. So, for each subset J and for each, each choice of fixed uh, variables, we end up getting the same setting as uh, for the main term. So we end up getting some polytop corresponding to the height, but in this restricted um, setting. And then we're going to get some linear function, and then we're going to get some maximum value and some maximum phase. And they all have to satisfy all the assumptions from before. And we are going to get the dimension of the uh, phase where the maximum value is attained. So now what happens is that essentially we are using um, the theorem, or the result from the theorem, which is essentially what we get from part one in this special setting. And we want this to be part of the error term, which means that if when we go into the restricted setting, we get a maximal value, which is the same or very close to the maximum value from the theorem, from the general case, then we want, we want to save some power of log. We want to get into the error term. So if the maximal value in this mixed range is too big, say epsilon close to the maximal value from the main term, then we want that the dimension of the maximal phase, which is the power of log we would get, is at most the dimension of the maximal phase for the main term, minus one. Well, this is always an integer, and so we just want it smaller than d, and we get d minus one. 
this is the technical condition on the polytope, polytope that I didn't write down before. And the reason we have this condition is because we are trying to do this method by putting all of this stuff into the error term. Otherwise, if you don't have this condition, then this could contribute to the main term. And I guess that one can try to understand how to deal with those cases. So we didn't do it. So this is the technical condition on the polytope. And let's see. I can say maybe one more thing, otherwise perhaps this seems a little bit too much hand wavy or not very clear. So what happens when we do this restricted problem, so we fix some of the variables, what does it mean? It means that we are, instead of working on R to the S, where my polytope lives, uh, I'm fixing the variables with indices not in J, I'm giving them a fixed value, which means I'm working on some linear subspace. So if I call this linear subspace, say L, then my polytope E xj is just the polytope P we started with, intersected with this linear subspace. And then what happens for this technical condition, which uh, I hope you understand why we need it, what does it mean, this condition? So there are a few cases. If this linear subspace intersects the maximal phase for the, for the whole polytope, then the maximal value A xj is the same as the maximal value A, but we are cutting with at least one hyperplane, so the dimension dxj is always going to be at most t minus one. That's good. That's the best case we can hope for. And then one can prove, so this is okay. And then one can prove if the, that uh, if one takes the linear space where we fix the variables in J and we put them all equal to zero, well, all equal to one, I suppose, and so for the purpose of the polytope, the exponents are zero. There's always some taking logs when we get to the polytope. <laughs> Um, if this does not, oh, what did I say? Sorry. If this was equal to, um, uh, yeah, non empty. If this is empty, so we just do one special case for this space, and this is empty, then we can prove that still this condition is always satisfied. So the main problem comes when can arise if we have our linear space x j no special linear space zero j um, intersect the phase and when the actual linear space that we are using when we fix those variables not necessarily putting them equal to the, the, that special value this is empty and then that's the case where something weird could happen now, I cannot draw a picture for you of this because this is at least four dimensional, but with a little bit of imagination, in, uh, in a, say, for example, projecting somewhere then on, on some, some subspaces, then the idea is a little bit like we have our situation, something like this. Assume the maximal phase is like one point here. This is not allowed for the maximal phase F in general because this is contained in a coordinate uh, uh, line. But uh, maybe in some projection or in some uh, cutting with some hyperplanes, this could, could happen. And then we have our polytope, which is something here, I don't know, some things. And then what happens is that depending on the type of condition, how big J is and so on, we could end up, uh, uh, we are moving away from zero, we end up with something like the LJ is maybe one line like this, and then we get another point. This has the same dimension. Or we could even, get in a worse situation where my LJ is not even a line in this picture, but it could be, say, a plane or something. And then it could cut something like this, and who knows, maybe I get even higher dimension. So this is something that we don't know how to control yet. Anyway, that's what's behind this technical condition. And if we have this, if we know that this holds, then we can uh, do this counting, special counting like this, and then we have to count over the, the remaining variables, and this we do uh, by using this uniformity, uniform bounds that I mentioned at the beginning.
bodies of the uniform bands. For the function the countable boxes, this was n prime of b. And this is, roughly speaking, the sketches proof of the theorem, which is most of the paper. All right, so I guess I can mention, um, now that we've seen how this works uh, a little bit, uh, we are not the first people doing this kind of work, obviously. So I'm just going to mention the first paper we have by Blomer and Bruder, 2017-18. They did the hyperbola method. For products of projective spaces. Okay, three n times itself some number of times. And this is what we had before. And then there have been various applications of this, uh, uh, always in products of projective spaces. And if you work with products of projective spaces and the usual heights, you don't have this technical condition coming up. It's always satisfied. The reason being that one is always in this condition here, which is the same as the condition for the projective space. If the maximal space doesn't touch any of the coordinate planes, then you're always fine, there's no problem. But we want to apply these tutorial varieties, as I'm going to do in a moment. And in that case, I mean, everything can happen. The one thing that I have, however, is a geometric problem. I don't know if the technical condition can ever not be satisfied by some height function on a toric variety. I know some cases where it, it holds, but I don't have a proof that it always holds and I don't have a counterexample. And another thing that I can say is that, well, you can count rational points also without this method. We have plenty of techniques and very refined techniques that have been uh, developed to count points, lattice points in regions with hyperbolic spikes. And our motivation to develop this method is because in the end, we are not going to count lattice points. We are going to count certain subsets of uh, lattice, which have very complicated structure, cannot be easily described just by equation, inequalities, coprimality conditions, and things like that. And so we don't know how to deal with that with a complicated height otherwise. And this is what I'm going to put on the board now. So now we're going to get some heuristics for Campana points. I hope that you can actually read something. On toric varieties. For me, the toric variety are Today, over the rational numbers, they are split, they are smooth, um, they are proper. So I'm going to define Campana points over this. 
component points will depend on choices of parameters m1 up to ms, one for each of the uh, variables in the counting problem, which in terms of toric varieties means one for each of the rays of the fan of my toric variety. And then the counting problem I want to deal with ends up being when we use this source of stuff and so on, lattice points in Z to the S that satisfy some condition on the points. Well, the first condition is the Campana condition is asking that XI is MI full for every I. So, This is our Campana condition. I'm not going to elaborate more on that. I, rem I recall that mi full means if a prime divides xi, then the same prime to the power mi needs to divide xi. All primes that divide xi need to divide it with powers at least mi. Then we have some coprimality conditions. These are nothing new. And then we have the height, which is just as before, product of absolute value of xi to the alpha i sigma at most b. And the reason why I write it down again, because if you know a little bit about toric varieties, then you get some sense of what is going on here. Sigma is going to be, in this case, ranges over the maximal cones of the fan of the variety X. And this corresponds to some sections of some line bundles. So in principle, I just have some line bundle that gives me the height. Later on, I'm going to choose the precise line bundle, but I have some heuristic that uh, work for all line bundles, that gives me a reasonable height, say, with an Oscar property. So the heuristics go like this. We have this situation. We want to come with these conditions. We have the hyperbola method technique, meaning we have to solve the two sub problem, number one and number two, count over boxes, and solve the linear programming problem. So to count over boxes, we have some results of Erdos and from uh, 1934, uh, which gives us, well, count m full integers of size at most b, and that gives me that in the uh, notation that I've set up before, when we count over boxes, these exponents in the main term, these phi i's are one over m i for each i. Okay. Well, this is some data that I need if I want to solve problem number two, which is this uh, uh, linear programming problem, which is maximizing some linear function depending on this on the polytop, depending on the height. So, in a paper together with uh, Arne Schmidt, Shota Nimoto, and Tony Varilla Alvarado, we set a conjecture for counts of Campana points in the bigger generality. In this setting, the conjecture says that we expect n of b that counting function to be asymptotic to some constant times b, some power of b, and some power of log b. I'm calling the first power a of l, the second power b of l minus one. This is uh, analogous to what we do for Manning's conjecture for rational points. And a of l is, as we expect, the infimum of the real numbers t such that t times the line bundle that gives me the height plus kx, the canonical divisor of the variety, plus a new divisor now that comes because we are working with Campana points, and this is a divisor, some one from i to s, one minus one over mi, the coefficients of di, where di is a divisor corresponding to the ith ray of the fan, so the torus invariant divisors here, and this is required to be effective. So this is 
are analogous to what we do for rational points expressed in the case of rational points. We don't have this new term. And this new term I'm going to call D sub M so that I don't have to write it again. And then we have B of L. And B of L, again, as in the case of rational points, is going to be the co-dimension of the minimal phase of the effective cone and the minimal phase that contains the adjoint divisor AL times L plus AX plus DM. So this very same thing when we consider AL the minimal value possible. So this is what the conjecture tells us. And what I can tell in the very last few minutes is that I can write this down. I can set out my setting for toric varieties. I can write this down explicitly. I can write down explicitly all the hyperbola method, the uh, machinery, the polytopes, and so on explicitly in the case of toric varieties. And then I look at them with the merits, and then we say, oh, this looks very similar to each other. So what happens is that by using the toric geometry to interpret seeing, uh, things uh, appropriately, then we observe that uh, this A of L um, power of B in the conjecture is the solution of a linear programming problem which is dual to the linear programming problem that we use in the hyperbola method, which I called LP. And then these are optimal solutions, and then duality for in linear programming tells us that then AL has to be the same as the value A from the other program. So we get that AL is equal to A. Good. And then we can also use more toric geometry plus this result to show that also BL is equal to the dimension D of the maximal phase coming from the other one plus one. Meaning the conjecture agrees with the result from the hyperbola method. Now the question is, can we actually use the hyperbola method for these toric varieties? So what happens is that if we take the log anti-canonical height, so minus kx plus this dm, so now I'm making a choice for this divisor, then I can do extra computations with this specific choice, and I can show that uh, the assumptions on the polytops, so the assumptions on P and on its maximal on the phase where the maximal value of the linear function is uh, uh, attained, are satisfied. except perhaps the technical assumption that I don't know yet how to prove in generality. And now because these are satisfied, and one can show that the conditions also for part one for the counting over boxes because of, well, the counting that we have from before, then we can do it uh, um, properly, and uh, all those assumptions are also satisfied. Then we have our second theorem. Which says that if we choose this log anti-canonical height, and we assume the technical condition is satisfied. Then the conjecture holds for toric varieties. So all I've been writing in this second part, uh, in the last part, is for the historic varieties.
Um, this is the result we have. We know that this technical condition is satisfied in, uh, well, at least a big number of cases. We don't know all of them. For example, this holds, I'm just going to write this one. This holds if the rank of the Picard group of X is at least the dimension of X plus one, and this can, if you have a variety of results and satisfy this, I can blow up and blow up a number of times, I increase the Picard rank, I get one which gives a rational equivalent with that condition, that's great. It's not so great for the fact that uh, Campana points, so these conditions are not rational invariant, are not a rational invariant uh, notion, so I can't really just pull back my counting problem and do it here. But apart from that, uh, we have plenty of examples. All right, I'm done. All right, are there any questions for Marta? It is all very clear. Yes. Yeah. So the question is if the harmonic analysis approach uh, uh, works for Campana points and toric varieties, and the answer is we expect that it does. Uh, it has not been done yet, uh, and Shaw tells me that it just requires some more technical um, work uh, with respect to the case of compactification of vector groups, which we know works uh, using that method. The reason for using this other method is the hope that we can apply this to varieties which are not compactification of vector groups, just uh, as for the universal torsor method for rational points. Yeah, maybe I should repeat. <laughs> Yeah, the comment is that the harmonic analysis approach has been used also in the PhD thesis of some treater, and that's true. And actually, it's a very interesting kind of result because it gives a completely unexpected and non-trivial answer to a certain counting problem. Any other questions? At the moment, I can't do it. The reason being that in that case, uh, some of those phi i exponents uh, would be zero, and the method doesn't support that yet, but the, it's uh, the next step that we want to work on, me and Damari, so the next thing would be to try to extend that, and then an analogous way to phrase it would be uh, removing the assumption that the phase f is not contained in any coordinate hyperplane. So that's the technical part that has to be done 